Okay, good. Um, yeah, so welcome to the new uh, season of VSET. Um, we're very happy that um, you're all back. Um, and uh, we are starting the season with Daron Adjomoglu um, with uh, the paper Community and Employment, Socioeconomic Foundations of Cooperation, which is joined with Alexander Wulitsky, uh, who is also here and has kindly agreed to uh, man the chat. So if you have um, smaller questions, please feel free to post them uh, in the chat and uh, Alexander will try to reply to you. Um, and then we are also very grateful to Najib Ali and uh, Ben Golub, who have agreed to be panelists on the talk. And um, yeah, the talk will be one hour. Uh, it's recorded. Um, and uh, after the talk, you also have the opportunity to, uh, to ask questions. Um, so then um, we are ready to go. So uh, Daron, if, you, uh, if you're ready. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I will share my screen. And uh, I can <clears throat> I can get started. So uh, thanks again, Julia and the whole team for inviting us. And uh, this is new work, Hot of the Presses, uh, with <clears throat> Alex Wolitsky, uh, who is here also, Community and Employment, Socioeconomic Cooperation and its Breakdown. So the motivating question for this paper is, I think, fairly familiar, that there have been profound social and economic changes in the United States over the last five decades uh, on the economic front. Of course, this is the topic of a large literature in economics uh, showing increasing inequality, stagnant or declining real wages for uh, regular manual workers. Uh, but also residential segregation, much lower levels of civic and associational participation, worsening community relations and declining generalized trust and other uh, various social problems. Our purpose is to take one abstract and one more concrete step at the same time. The abstract step is to uh, argue <coughs> you know, uh, that we need to or it would be fruitful to study employment relations and community relations jointly and provide uh, some of the first steps for doing that. And the concrete part of it is do it in such a way that could shed light on these trends, the joint trends that I've mentioned. And to motivate that a little bit more, I'm gonna show first some stylized facts uh, about the uh, relationship between or correlation between uh, employment and uh, community relations. And in, in I'm, I'll go, I'm going to show five facts and all five of them, I am going to look at the cross-sectional and over time relationship across different areas in the United States, commuting zones, uh, which approximate labor markets. And on the horizontal axis of all five of these figures, I'm going to have the log income ratio between managerial and non-managerial workers, which is roughly the same as the real wages of non-managerial workers, non-supervisory non uh, 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 non supervisory workers in the private sector. So just like think of workers that are not, you know, engineers, lawyers, uh, surgeons, and managers. Okay. And uh, so here is the first one with residential segregation. Doesn't matter which measure of residential segregation you use. This is an entropy-based one. But both in the cross-section across areas in 1990 and 2014, and when you look at the long differences, you see a positive relationship, which means places in which there is more inequality and worse conditions for regular workers, you're also seeing more residential segregation. The rich here are defined as those who are in the top 25% of the income distribution. But again, however you define it doesn't matter. The, the rich tend to have become more segregated and they were already more segregated in more unequal places in 1990, but it has only gotten stronger. This is one form of community change because it means that now people are interacting with a more homogeneous group in terms of income. Another dimension of community organization is when 
you are in the same community, do you use the same services? And a very important aspect of that in the United States is public schooling. And so the question is whether the rich people uh, are using the same uh, public schooling services as the rest of the community. And to do that in this three panel picture, which has exactly the same structure, again, we're looking in the cross section and time uh, cross section and the long differences, the likelihood of a household that has a manager or a high paid worker to send their children to private school for K through 12 versus the same for uh, uh, low pay workers. And that relationship is also uh, very positively related with inequality or the labor market trends, in particular in places where inequality has increased more, you see that within the community, the rich have also withdrawn from uh, using these community provided services. Instead, they are making use of a more market-based version of it via private schooling. Uh, all of this sort of is very related, of course, to Putnam's work on the decline of social capital. So we also wanted to show whether there will investigate whether there's a relationship here as well. And uh, the, mo the best measure actually turns out to be the, uh, uh, the one that Putnam himself emphasized a lot, bowling alleys. Churches would be another interesting one, but it's harder to get data on. And, uh, and, and when you look at bowling alleys, it's the same thing. There are fewer bowling alleys in more unequal places. And in the places that have become more unequal, the bowling alleys have grown less or have shrunk. Uh, but as you're going to see in a second, we're going to also link these community level changes to other aspects of organizations and two that we are going to particularly uh, explore is whether you know workers are subject to more monitoring or top heavy organizations and whether they are actually as happy or they have more grievances about their workplaces so the last two ones show uh, that so here we look at the relationship between the ratio of monitoring workers, you know, people who are managers, supervisory workers, and HR workers. And there is evidence that in more unequal places, you have more top heavy organizations, but also that it has become more top heavy in these places. And then finally, we look at uh, OSHA complaints by workers about their workplaces. This one is a little bit less clear cut. It wasn't so much correlated with inequality in 1990, but it becomes more so in 2014 on in long differences, at least some suggestive evidence that labor is not super happy in, the, in, in their organizations and their workplaces in places that have become more unequal. So that's just uh, some correlations that uh, are not just at the time series, like the ones that I mentioned at the beginning, but also at the cross section and within places that suggest that there are some joint evolution of uh, community and employment relation. So what do Alex and I do is to provide a, uh, a basic framework for thinking about this. And the way we do that is to you know, consider a world, a, a sort of a model of cooperation, community relations, in which managers and workers interact repeatedly in two different settings. In communities, in terms of providing public services, civic uh, capital, and so on, and in workplaces. In workplaces, they play different roles. There are managers and workers, and hence I was looking at the inequality between managers and workers. And in the community, they're more on an equal footing. Everybody has to keep the community functioning, You know, go to little league games or keep the streets clean and also contribute to uh, other uh, <coughs> collective action problems at the level of the community. In workplaces, we're gonna distinguish between Actually, in the paper, we do between three distinct managerial regimes, as you'll see. But here, let me just focus on two of them. We think of uh, two managerial regimes, which will be, of course, the choice of the managers, which we call soft equilibrium and tough equilibrium. In the tough, soft equilibrium, managers choose a high trust workplace in which there is high favor exchange. They pay a high wage, which generates a rent, which means a payment to workers above and below, above uh, uh, and beyond their outside option. So it's like an efficiency wage and a relatively low level of monitoring because you're using favor exchange and uh, high wage to motivate workers. In the tough equilibrium, it's a low trust environment, no or low favor exchange, 
low rent for workers, but high monetary. And uh, the distinct aspect of our model or framework is that these soft equilibrium, tough equilibrium choices are going to interact with what people do in the community. And uh, in particular, the key ideas here are also, we hope, are empirically grounded. The, the two that I would like to highlight here uh, uh, among these employment community interactions is one for workers, one for managers. For workers, it's a very well documented fact in economic sociology and some uh, more recently in economics as well, that entry into uh, high rent, high weight jobs, for example, in via recommendations is very much embedded in the community. Uh, you get these recommendations, Grana Vetter calls them from your weak links. Those are the people you know in the community. They're not your best friends. They're not your family, but they're people you meet in church or in uh, sports games or in other community activities. And, uh, and there is uh, evidence suggesting that you get these recommendations if you're in the good graces of the people. They say, yes, this is a reliable person for you to hire for a supervisor to a supervisor because he's been a reliable person in his community interactions. What that means is that misbehavior in the community is now going to have employment consequences. The same is true for managers. Misbehavior in the community would mean you cannot trust the managers uh, in workplaces, for example, for favor exchange. But the more interesting one is that for managers, there is the other way of causality as well. If you are a uh, not behaving to your employees in the way that the community expects you to, then you're going to be ostracized and treated bad, excluded in the community. Uh, this is, for example, uh, <clears throat> nicely illustrated by this case of Hormel Foods, the maker of spam, uh, where uh, there was a strike after years of very good community relations. And then you know, many journalists and uh, social scientists then subsequently wrote on it. And, and here is an interview from The Atlantic where you know, the workers are saying, or this is son of the Hormel worker who was striking, you know, in Austin, Minnesota, where Hormel food is, workers and managers uh, took each other's kids to school. They sat in the same pews as Surge. In other words, it's not like you're in a big city in Ronald Reagan or CEO of Chrysler. You didn't have to worry about going to church and having somebody spit on the back of your head. So this is the sort of the pressure that uh, the community relations put managers uh, under, meaning that if you behave in workplaces in a way that is not what the community expects, then you're going to be badly treated in the community. So those are the things that we're going to try to embed in a simple way. And, uh, and let me not explain the model more, or because I'm going to do that in great detail, but let me just give you a preview of the main results. So uh, the, the, I think one of the outputs of this exercise is this framework, which we hope will be useful to others as well. But then there are a bunch of results, high level and low level or high level and comparative static. At a high level, we see that uh, generally there are forces for the soft equilibrium to Pareto dominate tough equilibrium, even when profits are higher in the tough equilibrium. And the economic mechanism here is that the soft equilibrium generates more rents for workers. And if it is particularly valuable to have each one of these many workers exert community effort. That's very useful because then you can leverage the fear of being cut off through these high wage jobs for workers to motivate more community effort from them. But community effort is strategic complements for everybody. Once one person uh, exerts community effort that benefits others, but also you can incentivize more community effort from others as well. So the soft equilibrium under certain circumstances is going to enable to leverage these employment rents to support much better behavior in the community, more socioeconomic co cooperation in the community. And as a result, actually managers themselves can be better off even though they're making less profits because that, uh, that lower profits is more than compensated for by the better welfare in the community. And our interpretation of the trends that I showed above is going to be as a uh, shift from a tough equilibrium to a soft equilibrium. Of course, we don't literally mean that you know, managers are necessarily made worse off. That's just a possibility. But the, that possibility itself is sort of interesting that actually what each manager selfishly may do in order to increase profits may end up making the whole managerial class worse off as well. And I think, uh, Alexander, I think that 
the comparative statics are particularly interesting when you combine with these uh, welfare results. And so let me mention a, a few of the more perhaps surprising ones. We're going to see that a range of technological improvements can make uh, everybody worse off, so lead to Pareto inferior outcomes. First, monitoring improvements. So if you have better monitoring technology that makes the tough equilibrium more likely, again, that could lead to Pareto inferior outcomes. Uh, even more interesting is the technological improvements that look like automation, offshoring, or outsourcing, which means reducing labor requirements for producing the same output can also lead to Pareto inferior outcomes. Higher minimum wages or firing penalties, which are in them the, of themselves inefficient economically in our model can actually lead to Pareto superior outcomes. Why? Because they make the tough equilibrium less profitable and hence, uh, again, uh, sustain the employment rents that then feed into community rents. And, uh, uh, and of course, given what I have described above, you won't be surprising to uh, hear that better opportunities for residential segregation or better market provided community services such as schooling can make the soft equilibrium less likely and have similar results. They're also uh, in an extension, which I may or may not get to, I think I will uh, have uh, mentioned it uh, at the end, but let me mention it in here. Even just uh, plain vanilla labor augmenting or Hicks neutral improvements in productivity can lead uh, to good or bad outcomes or can make the soft or the tough equilibrium more likely. And the mechanism here is interesting because when firms become more productive, they hire more workers, so they become bigger. So then the question becomes, are bigger firms uh, more impersonal, so favor exchange is harder and monitoring is easier, or the other way around? So depending on that, you can actually create high productivity firms, but they are more impersonal. And if they are more impersonal, that could actually be bad for the community via the shift from the tough to soft equilibrium. Ron? If, yes, please. Uh, just yes. ask a clarifying question about the you know, yes. soft equilibrium. Are, do you interpret the soft equilibrium as workers getting fired for not doing community service? Is that somehow no. tied to their legal contract? No. So the, I'm going to be more specific on this in the model. So we could def, So there are many different ways of going here, and we selected one that we thought is both tractable and captures the the two mechanisms that I highlighted. So we're going to assume that employment is one period, so there is no firing. So the community employment relationships there is purely through job finding. So the recommendations are not being blacklisted. And, and formally, we're going to also assume that <clears throat> what goes on in the employment relationship is semi-anonymous meaning that outsiders see whether you have a tough equilibrium or a soft equilibrium, but they don't see the wage or whether the worker exerted the effort or not. Thank you. That answers it. Thanks, Majib. That's very useful. OK, obviously, we're related to several literatures. Uh, let me not spend much time on it. But, uh, but most importantly, I think we are uh, what we are trying to do is one step towards thinking about how economic relations should be thought as more socially embedded, embedded with the community, meaning that community influences the employment relationships and employment relationships influence the community. Uh, this is very, uh, uh, this is an important perspective in sociology and economic sociology. Uh, <clears throat> within economics, there is a literature on the interplay of market and non-market activities, which captures some of these ideas, but hasn't ventured into this employment community aspects as much and but we relate to this literature obviously the sort of the the reasoning that we have here between the two activities supporting each other has this Bernheim winston multi-market interactions one market supports the other and obviously we relate to efficiency wages and favor exchange in workplaces uh including uh questions of how this interplays with uh, endogenous monitoring and then more uh tangentially to residential segregation and inequality literature but there might be others that we have omitted and definitely feel free, especially if it's your papers that we have omitted. Uh, okay, here is the environment. It's an infinite horizon model. Both, uh, uh, everybody has a common discount factor delta. There are two kinds of agents, workers, fraction beta greater than a half and managers, fraction one minus beta. So that means that uh, if everybody was part of the employment relation, there would be an excess supply of workers. We're gonna assume uh, that interactions uh, are sequential. In odd periods, you work. In even periods, 
you do community interactions. Uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, the, 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 there are more details in the workplace relations. The community part is very important, but it's a little bit simpler. So let me start with the workplace relations. As I answered to Najib, employment relations are one period. So at the beginning of a period, workers and managers are randomly matched. And I'll talk about blacklisting in that context in a second. Uh, but imagine that you know I have matched with Ben. Then as a manager, then I offer Ben a contract which is a management regime, a choice of monitoring and a wage. And then also there's an implicit expectation of whether I will do a favor exchange. If uh, the wage is W, non-negative obviously. And if I choose high monitoring, that costs me an additional K. If the worker, Ben rejects it, both he and I get zero this period. And then we move to the next period. If Ben accepts it, then he has a choice to whether exert costly effort C. Uh, <clears throat> and then when that happens, he produces an output Y, which accrues to me, which I will then have to uh, pay part of it as wage. If uh, Ben shirks and doesn't put the effort, that's where the monitoring comes in. Under low monitoring, I catch him at probability P. Under high monitoring, I catch him uh, with probability Q greater than P. So what high monitoring just means that uh, I have a better technology for catching shirking. And then finally, I have to do, I have to decide whether to do a favor. A favor costs me an E positive amount and delivers a benefit D greater than E. So it's socially beneficial. For example, you can think of the favor as making the workplace more pleasant for the worker, that matters for the worker, or provide dignity, not boss the worker around. But also it could be like flexibility when he needs to go and pick up his kid, I allow him and that's very important and so on. Okay. Recap, here are the economic payoffs or the workplace payoff of managers. If the worker works, I get Y. If the worker is caught, not caught shirking, then I pay W. If I do the favor, I pay E. If I choose high monitoring, I pay K. As a worker, Ben gets W if he does not code shirking. Uh, <coughs> and uh, he also, uh, this actually should be it's wrong. It says exerts effort. If he exerts efforts, he pays the C. And then if he also receives the favor, it's D. Throughout, we're going to focus on the more interesting part of the parameter space, assuming this Two these two inequalities. This one says that high monitoring is always profitable. So if this inequality wasn't true, then the high monitoring would be irrelevant and we wouldn't have introduced it. So this is a fairly uh, innocuous assumption. And this one says that low monitoring without favor exchange is not profitable. So this is not an innocuous assumption. It could be interesting to analyze that case as well, but it's not that super relevant for our focus. So we're gonna rule that out. So if you're gonna do low monitoring, that's gonna rely on favor exchange. So we're gonna sort of put together the Shapiro Stiglitz style efficiency wages together with Akerlof style efficiency wages. Uh, just to be sure I understand the monitor. Please, Najib, yes. Um, so there are two signals, either the fire alarm doesn't ring or the fire alarm does ring. Yes. If I work, the fire alarm never rings. And if I yes. shirk, then with probability uh, Q, yes. Um, it, yes. it rings with the high monitor. Okay. Absolutely. absolutely. I should have said that it's just the usual assumption in these efficiency wage models that they simplify things with no type two errors. But obviously, yes, that's very important. And I, I should have emphasized that. Thank you, Najib. Community interactions are very, very important, but very simple. Everybody simultaneously chooses in the uh, even number periods a level of community effort, and everybody gets a benefit in a symmetric equilibrium in which all workers choose community effort AW, all managers choose community effort AM. They get this benefit where beta is the number of workers, B is an increasing function B of A of W. Alpha is a parameter we'll use for comparative statics. One minus B is the number of managers and then they do B, A and AM. And obviously AM and AW are gonna be different because A you know, 
workers and managers could be in principle be treated differently, but also they're going to get different rents and different profits and the community employment interactions are going to be leveraged for supporting different levels of effort. Payoffs for workers and managers from community interactions are simply B, this benefit minus the cost of effort, which we normalize to the level of effort, A9, A minus AW for the worker, minus AM for the manager. So the key things are observability and what you condition on and how you use that information. So this is where uh, <clears throat> Najib's question is very relevant. We're going to assume that all managerial decisions except the wage offer W are publicly observed. And that means that things can be conditioned on them. For workers, only community effort decision is publicly observed. So what are the things that you can condition on? So in particular, there are two kinds of exclusion activities that can be conditioned on these things. One is very easy. It's in the community. People can be ostracized from the community and be excluded from the community. So here I wrote the payoffs for workers and managers from community interactions under the assumption of no exclusion and symmetric equilibrium. But the more general way of thinking about this is this is the payoff when you're in the good graces of the community. So imagine somehow Ben as a worker falls out of the good graces of the community. So one of the things that the community will do to Ben is he will be ostracized, which means he won't get this benefit. So this benefit is going to church, going to little league, uh, getting friendly uh, advice from neighbors, perhaps informal insurance, all of these will be, Ben will be cut out of if he's not in the good graces of the community. The other punishment is the link from community to employment relation. So here, I assume, uh, I, I looked at the relationship between a manager and a worker <clears throat> after a match has taken place. So we're going to assume that whether a match takes place or not is also something in the control of the community. So you can think of this as either because Ben has misbehaved and managers blacklist him and they would never match with him, or more realistically along the lines of the Grand Ovetter, in order for this match to be consummated, Ben needs to get a recommendation from the community. And if he's not in the good graces of the community, he won't get the uh, he won't get the recommendation. If he doesn't get the recommendation, he never comes to this stage. That won't happen. None of these two exclusions will happen along the equilibrium path, but they are credible because excluding someone is not costly in the community and excluding or blacklisting a worker for a manager is not costly because there's an excess supply of workers. So those two are going to be the key things that we condition on, but critically, we are not conditioning on uh, the wage. And we're also not conditioning on whether a worker is uh, is is shirking or, or or working in the workplace. We think this is not unrealistic, meaning that employment relations are generally semi-anonymous, but it's also tractable. If you condition on the wage, then the incentive compatibility constraints become more complicated, and uh, and and you can produce more equilibria. In fact, we're going to make the equilibria as simple as possible, and we're going to focus on public strategies. So the decisions depend on this public history that I have just outlined, and we're going to look for perfect public equilibria that are symmetric, and also we're going to leverage uh, a simple tie-breaking rule, which again helps get rid of uh, unnecessary equilibria. We're going to assume that whenever indifferent managers are going to perform the favor. And then in the symmetric equilibrium, the two key objects in the community are going to be AM for manager's effort, AW for worker's effort. So that's it. That's the model. Are there... Any questions? You, you said that excluding people from the community is not costly. And I think there was something I missed about the payoffs there. I, I, you could imagine settings in which exclusion is costly. Yes. Uh, so so I'm, <clears throat> uh, so that, that's right. And even if it is costly, you could find public perfect strategies that support it. That would be like, you know, uh, the co community breakdown. There is community breakdown unless I, uh, I punish you. But here, what we're assuming is, you know, uh, 
you are just this B here, you're not going to get any more. So you're excluded from, uh, from all of the benefits. I see. But there's nothing like if uh, Ben is a great uh, baseball coach, now excluding right. Ben means that we don't we don't no. capitalize no. on his skills. No. no, we don't. We don't have that. Are these um, can I ask a quick question? So of course. This, in this thing, if this benefit from the community was asymmetric between workers and managers, right. would that matter? In particular, if managers cared little, yes, but maybe they matter. indirectly care because it sustains... It would matter. It would matter. But if we made the managers not care at all, so for example, if we had an alpha here that's W alpha M, and alpha M was much lower, then of course we would not get the Pareto ranking when tough equilibrium gives more profits. So for the result that even when the tough equilibrium gives more profits, it could be Pareto dominated, you need that the managers care. There's already a degree of asymmetry here because B is a concave function manager or worker effort may matter more. And that, that is actually important for some of the results in the paper, although not the ones that I'm going to emphasize most today. Thank you. Thanks, Emre. Okay. All right. Actually, even though the description of the workplace relations was a little bit more complicated, uh, you know, working out what happens in workplaces is actually very simple. Uh, and let me do that by going through first soft equilibrium. In a soft equilibrium, our, by definition, we have low monitoring and favor provision. So that means that a worker's expected payoff, if he puts effort, is W plus the value of the favor minus the cost of effort C. And if he shirks, he only get these goodies for one minus with one minus p probability. That means that the lowest incentive compatible wage is WC uh, or, uh, divided by p minus d. Now let's look at the payoff for workers and managers, and those payoffs are, by the way, quasi rents here because uh, when the worker and the firm don't agree, they get zero. So all of the surplus is a rent that you're getting above your outside option. So for firms, that's W. Sorry, for firms, it's Y minus CP plus D minus E. And notice that D here is a payoff for the firm. Why is that? Because the firm is doing the favor to the worker, but then is going to be able to recoup that by paying lower wages. And this is the reason why, if we go back a second, Y minus CP is less than zero, but that doesn't rule out soft equilibria because the firm is not going to get Y minus CP, but it's going to get Y minus CP plus the net value of the favor. And indeed, oops, I'm going in the wrong direction, sorry. And indeed, the worker's net payoff is <clears throat> W plus D minus C, but W, remember, has the D subtracted in it, so the worker doesn't get the benefit from the D, all of it goes to the manager. And the total surplus, of course, is the sum of these things, Y minus C plus D minus. Now, the other kind of equilibrium that I mentioned in the introduction was the tough equilibrium. High Sorry, monitoring. Jerome, and, yes, please. I, just that last, I didn't follow the arithmetic. So when you say that in the previous, when you the, the payoff for the workers, uh, on that you said it includes D there, but then D is subtracted. So this is the payoff gross of the D effort cost or? Yes. Yes. Got so it. the workers expected payoff is W plus D. I get the wage plus I get the favor. But then the incentive compatible wage subtracts the D because the manager knows I that, that I can, uh, I, uh, as a manager, I know that I can get you to do the work for lower pay because you'd expect the favor. So when you put this in here, the net payoff doesn't have D in it. Sorry, I was I went too fast on that. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ben. So the tough equilibrium, high monitoring, and no favor provision. This is much more closely. I mean, this is much closer to Shapiro Stiglitz. No Akerlof in here. It's the, so therefore the lowest incentive compatible wage is W C over Q. Remember Q, Q is greater than P. So that's why it's lower wage uh, controlling for D. And then the payoffs are, you know, 
exactly what you would expect. Now, there's a third type of equilibrium that turns out to be actually in some ways uh, more similar to the soft equilibrium than the tough equilibrium. We call it tough but fair equilibrium in which there is high monitoring, but still there is favor provision. And, uh, and, and the reason why it's got a similarity to the soft equilibrium is because you need to trust the managers to do the favors. And that trust, again, is going to depend on the community relation. So in that case, the wage is going to be C over Q minus D rather than C over P minus C over P minus D. But other than that, everything is similar. Okay. So payoffs for the agents are ranked like this. The payoff for the workers is higher in the soft equilibrium, economic payoff is higher in the soft equilibrium than the tough by fair and the tough equilibrium, which are equal. Why are they equal? Because the only difference between the tough but fair and tough equilibrium is the favor exchange. But remember, those favor exchanges are always monetized and taken away from the worker. So therefore, the worker doesn't actually get any differential economic utility in the tough but fair equilibrium. For managers, uh, <clears throat> the tough but fair equilibrium is really great. You get the high monitoring, and uh, and uh, and you monetize the value of the favor exchange. And in writing on this, this on the right hand side, I also introduced this notation tau. So what is tau? Tau is the difference between the manager economic payoff in the tough equilibrium minus the soft equilibrium. Going back to the previous slides, you'll see that there is no need for this to be negative or positive given the assumptions we've made. It could be positive or negative. And it has an important interpretation when this is positive, then payoffs for the managers are higher under the tough, tough equilibrium. This is the consideration in which selfishly each manager would like to be tough in the workplace, but sometimes community threats, threats of exclusion might prevent that. When tau is less than zero, then favor exchange is so valuable that even the managers may make higher profits or earn higher rents in the soft equilibrium than the tough equilibrium. But even in that case, we'll see that the tightness of the incentive compatibility constraint is pretty bad in the, uh, in the soft equilibrium. So it, it is still difficult to maintain a soft equilibrium. And again, community relations would matter. But I'm going to refer to in a couple of slides to the cases where tau is greater than zero, tau is less than zero. The Pareto dominance results are somewhat more obvious when tau is less than zero, perhaps a little bit more surprising when tau is greater than zero. And one more terminology question. When you said sure. the economic payoffs, uh, referring to one of these pies, are, what, what's the distinction you're making? Oh, because overall payoffs are going to be this plus what you get in the community, which is what I'm going to show next. Which Got is, it. You know, these are the pies. And then in addition, you have, you have to add to that this. And that's going to be your stage payoffs. And then you need to, of course, discount them. Thanks. OK. Community payoffs and incentive compatibility in the community is much more standard. And here, I just immediately write the incentive compatibility or immediately go to the incentive compatibility constraints. Uh, and uh, remember, again, if a worker fails, she's going to be ostracized and cut out from the worker community benefits, but she's also going to be blacklisted from employment. If a manager fails to exert community effort, then she's going to be excluded from community benefit, but also not trusted to provide workers in, uh, in, in workplaces. But he can always choose a tough equilibrium. So hence, here is the incentive compatibility for workers. I get an immediate benefit from my best deviation of saving the cost of contributing to the community. That's worth AW. Then next period, I get punished by not getting a job. The value of the job was pi w for me. The probability with which I got it was one minus beta over beta. Remember, there's an excess supply of workers. And then that's going to be discounted delta over one minus delta squared. And then in two periods time, in the community, I'm ostracized. So that's delta squared over one minus delta squared. So I use this as b. For the manager, same thing. But now the economic punishment is not to lose the full rents. Why not? Because as a manager, I can always go to the tough equilibrium. 
So if I'm already in a tough equilibrium, there is no economic punishment for me because I can always choose a tough equilibrium. If I'm in the soft equilibrium, say, and soft equilibrium was giving me greater economic profits, I could lose that. But if the soft equilibrium actually was giving me lower economic profits, I gain this period by not doing the community effort. I gain next period by increasing my economic efforts, my economic profits. But and then in two periods time and then on, I get all of these community. It's like in the Hormel case, people start spitting on me. Is um, whether the manager does a favor for the worker publicly observed? I missed. I missed this. Um, well, because there's like a holdup problem yes. at the end, yes. right? Yeah, um, yeah, no, no, it is because it, they would never do it if it wasn't publicly observed. Because right. remember, it's okay. a one-period relationship, and it's most costly. So the only reason they do it is because it's publicly observed. But I'm, um, but, but it is different. They're not just doing it for the community; they're doing it also because they would lose the, uh, uh, the ability to monetize those favors in the future. Okay, final intermediate result in the slide, and then we go into the results. Okay, so you can observe that community effort levels are positive externality generating and strategic complements. Positive externality, because you more effort you put, everybody benefits, but also look at this. If other people are doing more effort, that increases this on the right hand side, that means we can support more effort from you. So that immediately implies that the set of incentive compatible effort levels given a management regime is a lattice with the highest element or a highest pair. And moreover, unless the discount factor is very large so that we can support effort levels above the first best, which is not the case we're interested in, then the uh, Pareto efficient equilibrium will have the largest pair AWAM. And that's, of course, going to satisfy those incentive compatibility constraints I just showed you. OK. Now, first result. Bo all three of the <clears throat> management regimes I emerged can arise in equilibrium. In fact, they can simultaneously exist. Two pairs, or all three of them, can simultaneously exist. And the existence conditions are, in particular, the following. Let me actually start from the bottom. A tough equilibrium always exists. Why is that? Well, because as you saw, there is no need for leveraging the community, et cetera, for a tough equilibrium. The managers can always choose a tough equilibrium. So the, the tough equilibrium is always going to exist. Uh, tough but fair equilibrium exists if and only if it is unprofitable for a manager to deviate with the one uh, potentially profitable deviation, which is reneging on the expected favor. And the incentive compatibility for that is this, which is you save the effort cost, but then you, uh, you lose the community benefits and you lose the potential value of using the monetized value of these favors. The soft equilibrium, on the other hand, requires two inequalities. There are two valuable deviations here. One is that the manager can deviate immediately to tough and cut wages. And the second is he stays in soft while the worker is thinking, oh, I, you know, I'm not monitored and I'm going to get the favor, but ex post, he reneges on the favor. So both of these are binding constraints. And when you combine them, you get this condition here. Now, once you have these conditions and the uh, community uh, <clears throat> logic that I outlined, it's not difficult to see that there are a bunch of easy comparative statics. A soft equilibrium is favored by higher discount factors because then we can leverage the community better to ensure uh, better behavior. Higher alpha community ma uh, 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 effort matters more. Higher monitoring costs because it makes the tough equilibrium less attractive, et cetera. And similar comparative statics for tough but fair equilibrium. Now, these comparative, these comparative statics are interesting, but I'm going to come back to them because they're gonna become, at least in the way that Alex and I are thinking, they're gonna become more interesting once we look at welfare. So let me now do that. So for welfare, here is the, the main result. There exists a tau bar such that Unless tau is so large as to be above the tau bar, 
then the equilibrium, soft equilibrium, strictly Pareto dominates the tough equilibrium. So what that means is that whenever the soft equilibrium is as profitable as the tough equilibrium for the manager, and beyond that point when it has more profitability for the manager, but it's not like hugely more profitable, everybody is in total better off in a soft equilibrium. And the reason for that is that in the soft equilibrium, we use the employment rents to leverage more worker effort that then gets us more manager effort that then gets more worker effort and so on and so forth. Moreover, a tough but fair equilibrium, whenever it exists, always strictly Pareto dominates tough equilibrium. Why is that? Because in the tough but fair equilibrium, you're getting the monetary value of the favors as well for the manager. Uh, but because the favors are being carried out, workers are no worse off, where managers are better off. Now managers put more community effort that then put, gets workers to put a little bit more community effort and so on. And then you can also compare welfare in the soft and tough but fair equilibrium. But since time is short, let me not do that. And because in what follows, I will simplify the discussion and just focus on the comparison of tough but fair. Uh, to tough and soft equilibrium. So the next uh, four slides, essentially, I'm going to give you our main comparative, or seven slides, uh, our main comparative statics. Some of those are going to be in the in the main model, and then I'm going to uh, put two uh, very natural extensions that, you know, in some sense, should have been part of our <coughs> overall framework from the beginning, but we wanted to isolate the more novel elements in the simplest possible way. So the first one is that better monitoring technologies, higher Q or lower K, can destroy the soft equilibrium and lead to Pareto inferior outcomes. Given what I have said so far, this shouldn't be a huge surprise. What happens is that when you have, say, lower K, the tough equilibrium becomes more attractive. The tough equilibrium becoming more attractive tightens this incentive compatibility constraint. Where is was it? Uh, where is it? Okay. This incentive compatibility constraint for the soft equilibrium to exist. So if you just make the soft equilibrium disappear, then you are essentially in this case where the both the soft equilibrium and the uh, and the tough equilibrium exist at the margin, and in that case so long as tau is less than tau bar, this would be a Pareto inferior move. So that's the intuition for this result. I, I just missed the, the logic. When you said exists at the margin, you're, you're talking about a parameter change that's going to kill one of these, yes. kill the soft equilibrium. Yeah. So you're saying it just bare, the soft equilibrium barely exists, and now we have to move to the Pareto. Exactly. I, I, uh, I'm giving the intuition that way. I mean, you know, it, it uh, because in some sense, this proposition here, uh, only ranks these in terms of welfare when they both exist. So in, we have to do a proof for showing this other result, but I'm just giving a loose intuition. Got it. Now, the other type of uh, uh, interesting technological change, which is relevant because, for example, one of the things that led Hormel to the strike and the uh, breakdown of the manager community relation is the uh, introduction of labor saving technologies and also offshoring and outsourcing. So uh, pe many people have conjectured that these may have more uh, negative community level consequences. For example, work by Outer, Dorn, and Hansen shows that trade with China led to community decline, which is in line with Wilson, William Julius Wilson or Case Deaton or Charles Murray's, et cetera, uh, broader sort of discussions. So in our model, one way you can think of these labor-saving technologies as you keep output the same, but you have less labor requirement, meaning less C, less effort. So if you do that, then lower C actually reduces welfare and can lead to Pareto inferior outcomes exactly along the lines of the same intuition. This reduces worker rents. When worker rents are reduced, especially when rent to reds matter a lot, which is in our model doesn't incorporate what Emre was saying, but incorporates it matters differentially because 
you may be more in the concave region. So in that region, reducing worker rents are going to is going to have both a direct negative welfare consequence, but also will reduce manager uh, uh, effort, and the whole community can again suffer mightily as a result of these technological changes. So what makes these two propositions interesting is that uh, in many of the economic models where economic relations are uh, analyzed in an isolated way, you might think these are technological improvements, they shouldn't be that bad, but they can lead to fairly negative consequences because of the interplay of community and employment relations. I guess one sort of a counterpoint that, or an interest, so, you have a bunch of comparative statics that show kind of into that the things favored by the technocratic class might be bad and the one one sort of it seems like in your given your forces if unemployment were if involuntary unemployment were harder and you still needed some kind of community endorsement you know more as a result that could actually you know if you could raise that at the same time some of these other things were happening you might restore some of the importance of the community I see. So you're saying unemployment benefits so other, or other transfers. I think it's an interesting thought. I, I was thinking that the more desperate workers are to have a good reference. You oh, could, oh you unemployment, have, unemployment, they, unemployment. Yeah, yeah. I you, see, you I could, see. You could keep, you could sort of make make some kind of soft forces important and preserve at least some part of the economy where this stuff still has an, because right. in reality, right. the economy I is see. sort of heterogeneous. I see, I see. see. Uh, that's an interesting question. I have to think about that, Ben. But it, to have the unemployment's effect uh, in an interesting way is going to be more complex because now if you're an unemployed worker and unemployment is high, we're gonna have a very hard time from, uh, to get effort from you for the community. Because now the prospects of anything from the employment front is really bad for you. On the other hand, if you're an employed worker and unemployment is high, the threat of losing that job may be particularly good, so we may be able to get more effort from you. So then it's going to matter about whether con concavity versus convexity, which one's efforts matters more, which one's efforts moves more, et cetera, et cetera. But it's an interesting set of issues. But in the model, the fact, as it is, I guess, the, the workers are always rationed. I mean, there's there's always extra workers. Workers are, are always rationed at the same number of workers, and we could do comparative studies with respect to beta. But it's a sort of an interesting issue that you're raising. Because the, and we should have thought about this, Ben, that's a very good point. Because, you know, the emphasis, you know, I, I, I cited the Wilson, Murray, Case, Deaton uh, evidence that they don't have models, but I think their emphasis is more on unemployed workers. So that was explicitly the case for Wilson. So the unemployed drop out of the community, they don't do enough. Whereas our emphasis is every member of the community actually. Uh, is motivated by uh, employment rents as well as the community behavior. So they are more embedded in our model, but we should have gone back to their intuition in a more careful way as well. That's a good point. Thanks a lot. But Ben also anticipated my next set of results. Other seemingly bad or good things might have counterfactual effects. One of them is imposing a minimum wage. So if we put a floor on the wages, so long as workers are not fired. That's inefficient in this model. The model's employment part is sort of neoclassical in that sense, but it actually would could lead to, uh, imposing a minimum wage could lead to Pareto superior outcomes. Why is that? Because a minimum wage makes the tough equilibrium less attractive because it's gonna be more binding in the tough equilibrium. When you make the tough equilibrium more attractive, you make the soft equilibrium more likely to exist, and then you leverage the soft equilibrium for good outcomes. And then the same thing would also uh, uh, work for uh, firing penalties. So this is the end of the model as I laid it out, but you know, going back, there were two obvious things we could have and should have perhaps, I don't know, put into the model, but we didn't because we wanted to keep it as simple as possible to highlight these new mechanisms. But one is outside options. So people opt out of the community, the residential segregation or sending their children to private school. So we, so far we haven't allowed that. And then the second is we also assumed, uh, again, Ben's question was very much on target on that, one worker, one firm, but obviously firms hire more workers. Uh, so that margin is also interesting. So the full model in some sense, think of it as incorporating these two things. So let me now mention them very briefly. Uh, opting out, we're gonna model that in a very simple way. 
uh, you can go to an enclave when you interact with other people, not the community, or you get your services such as private schooling or uh, nice lawns and nice clean streets, not from the community. That's going to be worth gamma W for workers and gamma M for firms, oh, sorry, for managers. And when that happens, you are, you're cut off from the community. So ostracize, ostracization, uh, exclusion, et cetera, those don't matter. That's going to change the incentive compatibility constraints in an usual, <clears throat> in a completely predictable way. <coughs> Uh, now we have a minus gamma W on the right hand side and a gamma M on the right hand side. So a higher gamma M means that the punishment that you're going to be subject to as a manager and therefore what we use as the carrot or the stick to motivate you is going to be smaller. How does that change things? This is actually not super surprising in some ways about the community employment relations really enriches these responses. And the reason why it's not surprising is because you see similar sort of effects in the market versus non-market interactions literature. But if I increase either group's outside option and this outside options are still not exercised, then this leads to Pareto inferior outcomes. Obvious, why? Because if the outside options are not exercised, what happens is that I'm just tightening the incentive compatibility constraints for community effort. So everybody is worse in the community. That's what the previous literature also understood. In our model, in addition, you're also getting all the employment interactions and it can actually shift you from the soft to tough equilibrium. So you get magnified effects. If you have a higher outside option for a group that is exercised, this reduces the other group's welfare. It may be actually good for the group. If I have a great outside option, that's good. That's not Pareto inferior for me, but it's gonna be bad for the other group. And then we also have some results which depend on this concavity that, uh, or the asymmetry that Emre was uh, asking about, polarization of outside options when you know, things get better in the rich enclaves and they get really bad for in the poor enclaves, that's gonna be really bad. For, well, that could be bad, no, it, could, it could or may not be. Then it's gonna matter whether uh, manager effort or worker effort is more important. The final thing, and then I'll conclude, is about productivity and firm size. Now, we allow managers to choose the number of workers from a discrete number, just to keep things still like a well-defined game. And, and then we also introduce this parameter, theta, which is the Higgs neutral productivity, and then G is the production function for the firm. Uh, G of L is the number of workers who work. Everything else is the same, except that now we are allowing the favors and monitoring to also be a function of the firm size. Why is that? Well, favors are you know personal things. I need, I knew, I knew you, I know you, and I uh, treat you well. And how I treat you well may be very different than how I treat Julia or how I treat uh, Najib. Or uh, I know you, and I know that when you say you need to pick up your kid, that's really true. It's not you're not gaming me. So that again requires perhaps a small community, or it may well be that there are economies of scale in favors as well. You can uh, you can install much better bathrooms, and that's good for everybody. And same thing in monitoring. You can have economies or diseconomies of scale in monitoring. Diseconomies of scale in <clears throat> in monitoring would mean that large organizations are much harder to monitor. But economies of scale will be the case, for example, you set up a new HR practice, that's a fixed cost, but now you monitor everybody better. I think a plausible case, at least to us, is that larger organizations make monitoring cheaper per worker, economies of scale in monitoring, and they make favor exchange harder. So they become more impersonal organizations. And if that's the case, if there are economies of scale in monitoring and diseconomies of scale in favor exchange, then higher productivity actually makes the soft equilibrium less likely and can again lead to bad welfare effects. On the other hand, this result is not ambiguous. If you have economies of scale and economy of, in monitoring and economies of scale in favor exchange, the opposite could happen here from Ben and Najib, which I'm looking forward to. So conclusion, this is our uh, my, uh, Alex and my first step towards a model of employment relations embedded in the community and vice versa, both parts affecting each other and jointly evolving. We are mo motivated, but hopefully the model is beyond these motivations useful as well, but we are motivated by the recent changes in employment and community life in the United States and other industrialized nations. And we think that just recognizing the 
the the more social nature of the employment relationship is an interesting direction for many models of the labor market and vice versa for thinking more about socioeconomic cooperation uh, and the fact that as Ben put it very nicely some technocratically uh, attractive technological and institutional changes can lead to these stark counter uh, stark counterintuitive or paradoxical results is at least an intriguing direction for thinking about these issues, both theoretically and empirically in the future. Thanks a lot again for the invitation. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so we will start uh, with the panelists. So if Najib or Ben, uh, I don't know who wants to start, if you have any uh, more questions or comments. Uh, I can go ahead. So um, I'll um, I'll start off with like I guess two comments and a question. Uh, the first comment is this is really nice. Um, I think it's uh, oftentimes when I think of networks, I think the information spillovers of being able to find jobs and how we connect to people is a very important feature. And I haven't seen other models that do this kind of multiplexing of community relations with how it helps me find managers and workers and think about how that benefits me in the workplace. So I, I, think, that's, I think it's a really nice step to take and it's uh, very interesting. The second comment is that, you know, in a lot of our like multiplexing intuitions that either come from multi-market collusion or other features, highlight the benefits of multiplexing. And sometimes when I'm talking to my friends in Bangladesh, they, they complain about multiplexing. They complain about the fact that there's a single supplier who's in charge of multiple things that they would want to do. And that this supplier has an outsized uh, bargaining power in their relations. Um, and so I've, I've, I've often tried, I've struggled to square this intuition with what we know from let's say multi-market collusion. Um, but this does definitely seems to be a prime complaint that they get very bad terms in one relationship and they can't ostracize that supplier because they need that supplier for other things. And this is supplier, someone who can renege on them pretty often and they just have to deal with the person's crap. Um, so, so that's my second comment. Um, my question was trying to understand the role of the favor in the model, which is, it seems to be that the the reason you need a favor that costs less to the manager than to the, um, and then the benefit it provides to the worker is to generate this kind of um, hold up at the end, but you wouldn't be able to do it simply with having wages paid at the end with our standard transferable utility model. But if somehow wages were more valuable to the worker than they were costly to the manager, then would the same intuition apply? And then I wouldn't necessarily need to have favors at the end of the employment relationship. That's it. That's all I think. Should, I, should I respond or should I? Yeah, wait maybe it would make maybe it would make more sense to not to to have it more as a conversation. I'm happy to go after you respond. Okay. To so thank you, uh, Najib. That's a very very uh, generous assessment and. Uh, a point about one supplier, I think that's very interesting. That's not really so much in our model because that also raises issues of bargaining power. I think that's very interesting when you are the single multiplexing versus single plexing, I think change bargaining power, especially in informal places. I think that's very, very interesting. In terms of the favor exchange, it's a super, super important question. And sorry, I wasn't more clear on this, but given that <clears throat> there is this community element here, uh, you know, if the if the favor exchange wasn't there, the tough equilibrium would be more profitable for managers, and then you could leverage those things in the community, and you know it would also lead to better community relations. So, in some sense, favor exchange is our way of saying, let's introduce the role of trust in the organization so that you can leverage community relations to do something good in the organization using that trust as well. So without that, it will be just like, oh yeah, the tough equilibrium, you know, we have a better monitoring technology, we avoid that and then we can leverage that for the community. So it's something that doesn't put the two things on the same uh, uh, level playing field in some sense and that 
putting them on the level of same, or what we think is putting them in the same level results. Come on, thank you. Is it, um, I'm, I want, I'm getting, uh, I have drone with a little bit of a, of a um, disruption sometimes. Is that, is that drone's connection or my, is yeah, it, maybe it's my connection? It may be my connection. But, but people can hear me okay. I can hear you, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I, my quick, it's, I guess mostly I have a comment, um, which is just, I, I think it's a super, I really agree with what Daron said about this as a, as a way of bringing economic sociology th uh, ideas into uh, thinking about the employment relationship very much. And then I like that the game theoretic um, techniques are, are the way that's used to do that. I actually, I did sort of it's hit me at some point that that the way in a way that there's a social interaction that's used to subsidize um or or support or make more likely a good equilibrium in a commercial space and one uh there's a, a sociologist um stovel catherine stovel um who's famous in networks but she has an agenda on, on brokerage and i she and i once wrote a small paper uh making making the point that she she has an uh, idea of organizational grafting where some kinds of exchange, maybe the way to say it to an economist is you could imagine a situation where efficient trade is impossible for Myers and Satterthwaite reasons. There's just not enough. So you have to add, you know, there's no surplus. To, you can't add enough surplus to drive the uh, best mechanism. But if you could somehow graft this um, Myers and surplus problem onto a community club and exclude people from the use the community access to the community club the rents that it generates to pay to create the extra rents sell tickets and then use that to fund the Myers and Satterthwaite surplus yet then you could have efficient exchange and so she thought about this as as a way to think about some some sites of brokerage or exchange or trade that would not be possible in a pure market sense but were subsidized by the social uh, world in which they were embedded. And so in some way, you guys are about that, but in the employment relationship, which I think is super exciting. Uh, I did wonder, you know, your your community um, is modeled in a very detailed game theoretic way. Um, I was riffing off something that Jeep said and things that you were saying at the end of your, at the end of the talk, I would have almost liked a more reduced form discussion of what is it that's critical about the community subsidy. Maybe if we don't think so much about its dynamic structure, but just like describing it as a reduced form source of subsidy, what is it that matters? Because I think, you know, it's a little bit, a non-game theorist might be a little put off by the exact, you know, modeling it as a detailed favor exchange model, but it seems to ring very true that some kind of more abstract technology, we really want to know what properties it should have to best subsidize a commercial space that, would run inefficiently without it. Thank you, Ben. Those are were excellent suggestions, and that reference definitely should be in our. Yeah, in, in relation to to the previous point made about uh, in relation to Marshall Satterwhite, uh, uh, I mean one key issue there is that the utility or returns or whatever they are are exposed non-observable. And this is one of the key reasons for the impossibility result. But in settings of firm where returns may be observable, the result doesn't go necessarily through. So at a in case of firms, uh, I don't know, depending on whether cash flows are observable or not, the result may be different. So. Yeah, interesting. Because the the, the impossibility result in of the quite is driven by the non-observability. This is the key. It's not really the two-sided adverse selection which really drives the results. It's the non-observability, which doesn't allow you to write any contract because it's an exposed realization. No, it will be interesting to think of the repeated version of those things with different observability assumptions. I mean the, I think Ben's analogy is sort of at a high level between that and this problem our incentive compatibility constraints are very different. And obviously, as I said, very in passing, we're taking Delta not to be too large so that you can't implement everything to start with the first best and so on. So that's the environment we're in. Right. 
Uh, thank you very much. Um, so we have time for more questions. So if uh, anybody else has a question, so just feel free to unmute yourselves. Or a comment. <laughs> can, I, can I ask a sort of um, a related? Yes, of course, Max. Um, question it seems like here you know there's this site site favors or, or or you know payments call it in general form to enforce something or hope to enforce something good but to improving is there a, a space for you know equilibria that are much worse because of that community uh you know uh, relations or site payments uh, so something that keeps the the society uh, you know, back rather than than uh, a part of improving, and and I'm not talking about just just uh, uh, the uh, the um, what is it, uh, tough I think equilibrium will call it, but but something even worse. I don't know the answer to that, Alex. No, I, I think basically the answer is yes, right? And so, you know, we've got a model with these uh, sort of repeated game aspects on both sides, especially in the, you know, the community is basically a repeated prisoner's dilemma. And so our focus is on, you know, how you can use that continuation pay to play to support uh, efficient employment relations. But, uh, you know, you're right that you could also imagine some kind of bad equilibrium where the community is, you, you know, pathologically you know, unless you do some, unless you do something bad, you get excluded from the community. And that can be an interesting angle also, although it's not what we're focusing on here. But given the choices we have, I think the worst thing that can happen in the community is zero effort. That's an equilibrium. And then the worst thing that can happen in workplaces is tough equilibrium. So I think given our assumptions, we cannot go worse than that. But one could relax our assumptions perhaps, and you can have other things like other choices in the workplaces that really damage the equipment or something. I don't know. I mean, but just like, you know, just to, you know, explain the model a bit. I mean, right, you, you could imagine that there's some norm where, you know, there's not supposed to be any employment at all. If you right. if you hire the worker, supposing that was observed, you know, then that would be violating the norm against work. And then you would right. need some opportunity right. for that. Of course. Right. But that couldn't give you a lower utility than zero in the community plus the wage. Well, the wage under tough equilibrium because that deviation is always available, I think. Yeah. Since we have time, I wanted to know what uh, the two, uh, Daron, you and Alex, make of this alternative uh, story, which is suppose that there was um, some, you know, if I'm working really hard, I'm really tired, and it's really hard to put in time into my community, it raises the cost because I'm already tired and time is kind of scarce. Mm. And so, you know, in high monitoring regimes, I expect my effort to be translated into output really well. So I put in a lot of effort, but this just takes away time and energy from putting it into the community. On the other hand, if there's really low monitoring, I'm not expecting my effort to translate that much into my wages or my output. So I don't put in much effort, have a lot of energy, and now I can volunteer for 10 billion things. Yes. Yes. Well, that's a very, very interesting thought, Najib. Uh, you know, it's easy to incorporate at a high level into a model like this. You know, you have an effort choice. Let's make it actually continuous since we're not solving it on the spot. Uh, uh, you know, you have a workplace effort and then the cost is jointly convex in workplace effort and community effort. But that's going to make things really complicated because the same strategic complementarity forces that we have highlighted would still remain, but now this will introduce a strategic substitutability force. And then which one would dominate? Yes, absolutely. I think for some professionals, that's exactly what's going on. They're too busy to contribute to their community. But on the other hand, if you believe the Wilson, Case Deaton, you know, <clears throat> Charles Murray type of account of these communities that are declining when good, good job opportunities are low, at least our mechanism is also there for some communities. And then the question is, can you get that to work in a way that you have a coherent equilibrium that uh, for some people it's one, for some other people? That's an interesting question. That's a good, good, good thought. Yeah, exactly. I said, I Alex? Mean, realistically, yeah. it, it makes sense that there could be technological interactions between 
community interactions and employment interactions. But I think in, in terms of the model, I think, you know, we kind of like this feature that these things are technologically independent and just the only interactions are sort of informational and strategic between them. So that's sort of what we're focusing on here. But it did make me, that comment made me think also of something that I think is really real. Like if you look at ex executives, I just like, you know, and friends I know who worked for Facebook feel, felt like people like Sheryl Sandberg were just maxing out on both, like the, the complementarity you're talking about seems to be very active in the managerial class that they'll spend a lot of time in their spare time doing things that are that I think they think are complementary to their status at work and make their them able to ask more. So at some level, your story is very focusing on one interaction between workers and managers. But there's sort of a bigger question. If you think of the economy as heterogeneous and having these forces operate more in some parts of the economy, like but in some, you know, within the managerial class, this might have become more important because I have this feeling that there are a lot of soft goods provided. They're just not for the, you know, it's just not among among the working class anymore somehow. I don't know. It just, it seems yeah, like. No, it could it, be. I mean, I think there are many, many different aspects to it. You know, certainly there's going to be a path where you think that community effort is going to help you in your career. I mean, the U.S., that's like uh, starts early because, you know, some sort of community activity helps you get into good colleges. And so there's going to be some people who are going to uh, be on that path, but they think that this will help them and it's good to, to remain in the good graces of at least some group. But on the other hand, you know, you don't see that many Wall Street bankers and management consultants as well as top certs in the kitchen. They're just too busy. That's the Najib Valley story. Thank you very much. So I think we can wrap up the, the official part. So thank you so much, Daron. And uh, uh, Alex and uh, Najib and Ben for uh, uh, 